you're not going to like this. I just broke a cardinal rule for preachers. It's a no-brainer, preaching, basic preaching, one-on-one. You just don't do it. Because if you do, you shoot yourself in the foot. Never start a message with those five words. You're not going to like this. I mean, why create a barrier or raise a notion that might preempt the reception of truth, right? Especially when it comes to a subject like the one we've been talking about for the last few weeks and the one we'll be talking about for the next few weeks, our identity in Christ. We've said it over and over again, we are who we are in Christ. We are disciples of Jesus. Our identity is not in our politics. Our identity is not in our ethnicity. Our identity is not in our sexuality. Our identity is not in our reputation. Our identity is not in our ancestry. It's not in our net worth. It is not in our appearance. Our identity is not in our achievements or our abilities or our intelligence or our livelihood or even in our biological families. Our identity is in Christ. So when it comes to the aspect of identity in Christ that I want to talk about today, I will resist the temptation to begin by saying, you're not going to like this. Instead, I'll say something like this, this teaching of our identity in Christ may not initially sound appealing to many of us. Way back last November when I was meditating, pondering on the development of this series, I I started making a list of the ways our identity in Christ is presented in Scripture. And I wrote my list down and I dated it. Saints, children of God, more than conquerors, heirs, chosen, elect, beloved, salt, light, ambassadors, God's workmanship, living stones, flock, bride, body, priests, royalty, God's field, God's branches, God's building, God's family, God's temple, God's dwelling place. I mean, those are some some big-time designations, some esteem-building designations. They are are compelling facets of our sparkling, multifaceted identity in Christ. So perhaps you can imagine my reaction when it hit me that one of the most dominant... uh, undeniable, uh, primary descriptors of a lifelong disciple of Jesus is a word with extremely negative and distasteful connotations, especially to American believers. We are slaves. We are slaves of Jesus, servants of Christ. Think of it this way. Imagine you're sailing along through the beautiful gospel of Luke, written by Dr. Luke. In chapter 1 and 2, your heart is warmed by the beautiful story of Christ's birth. In chapter 3, the ministry of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus and his genealogy. In chapter 4, his triumph over temptation, the beginning of his public ministry and healings. In chapter 5, the exhilarating description of his selection of his first disciples, his confrontation with his oppressors. In chapter 6, choosing more disciples and the the beauty of the Beatitudes. And chapter 7 comes along more healing and teaching, the forgiveness of a great sinner and, and Jesus' defense of her. In 8, 9, and 10, the teaching and miracles and transfiguration. In 11, 12, and 13, more confrontation with the Pharisees and some wonderful parables in chapters 14, 15, and 16, including the parable of the prodigal son in chapter 15. And then you start on chapter 17 with its call to forgiveness and faith and the story of the healing of the ten lepers. And as you have done from the beginning, you anticipate everything those words tell you about who you are in Christ and your identity in Christ. You're anticipating more of that. And then you see verse 7. And it's in red letters. It's Jesus speaking. And he says, which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he's come in from the field, come immediately, sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward 
you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? And then he gets to our identity. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Part of our identity in Christ is that we are His servants. We are His slaves. Now, we like that son stuff and that saint stuff and that God's workmanship stuff, but we're His slaves. And there are multiple reasons why we might be tempted to reject this aspect of our identity in Christ, and I'll mention just two of them. First, and rightfully so, because of our abhorrence of the evils of slavery and our desire to be distanced from it. If you're like most of us, when we think slave, our minds automatically go to the evils of American ethnic Civil War era slavery and the residual effects of it today, and we hate that. We renounce it. We distance ourselves from it. It's reprehensible. We rightfully recoil. Contrary to the assertion of many, the Bible does not endorse or promote slavery. Scripture expressly prohibited what was called man-stealing. It prohibited abusive and oppressive actions toward fellow human beings. It provided what was called the year of jubilee, the freeing of the slaves. Part of the proclamation of Jesus' ministry was to proclaim liberty to the captives, and it was the teachings of Jesus and the apostles that inspired and undergirded those who demanded and fought for the abolition of slavery and the rights and humanity and equality of all people. Until Paul made that great declaration in Galatians, no more slave, no more free, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And yet there was slavery in biblical times, and the Bible gives some instructions about it. And what we often fail to realize is that there were many other periods of slavery in history, including Greco-Roman slavery in biblical times, which was way more nuanced than Civil War era slavery. It could still be a very uh, terrible thing, but there were also people who voluntarily sold themselves into a limited period of servitude. There were some who accepted servitude as an alternative to death when they were captured in war by the Romans. Some were sold into it. Some were born into it. Some chose it. Some were quite handsomely rewarded or even greatly esteemed in their roles. There were people who were professionals, even doctors and lawyers, who were nearly indistinguishable from free persons in the same profession as they interacted daily. Now, don't hear me wrong on this. We dare not sanitize any kind of slavery but we know that the slavery in Jesus' day was different and more nuanced of a system than how we often think of slavery in a one-dimensional way today. And some historians estimate that up to one-third of the population in Jesus' day were slaves. So this metaphor would have been more easily grasped by its first recipients. Jesus is not endorsing or promoting slavery. He's simply referring to something that is very common in their day that they can understand. But one of the reasons we don't want to claim this moniker of slave is because of our natural abhorrence and hatred of slavery. But there's a second reason that's not nearly that noble. And the second reason is because of our natural unwillingness to be told what to do. Don't tell me what to do. I mean, our children, from the time they come, you're not my boss. Well, I got news for you. Yes, I am. <laughs> but that continues into adulthood, doesn't it? You're not my boss. In, in the first church where I served, there was a couple, husband and wife, they were both uh, involved in education. The husband had his master's degree. And while we were there, his wife obtained her doctor's degree. And she became the superintendent of schools. He was a very quiet man. You rarely ever heard a word out of him. She was very outspoken. We had a party to celebrate the fact that she had obtained that doctor's degree. It was at a nice restaurant. There were 30 or 40 uh, people there, and we were enjoying the celebration. We're in the midst of, of the dinner that evening, and someone asked a question out loud that everybody in the room heard. They said to the husband, now that she is a doctor, are you going to call her doctor? And the room got deathly quiet because everyone wanted to hear what this man who hardly ever said anything was going to say. 
And without hesitation, as clearly as possible, he said, I'll call her doctor when she calls me master. <laughs> I often wished I was a fly on the wall in their home that night. There's just something that wells up in all of us, whether we're outspoken or not, that says, don't tell me what to do. And so while we're talking about our identity in Christ, we, we shy away from this slave imagery because of our abhorrence of slavery, but also because of our natural unwillingness to be told what to do. John chapter 8, Jesus was speaking to the Jews who believed in him. It says in verse 31, he was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you'll become free? He's talking to Jews. You can become free. <laughs> we have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Hello? I mean, the major part of their history, 400 years, the children of Israel are slaves in Egypt, and yet they say, we've never been enslaved to anyone. Don't tell me what to do. So let's just admit it. Both of those reactions are intensified by our Americanness, right? And I want to ask you, to allow me to invite you to consider the compelling case for seeing yourself as a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. And I want to show you why. First of all, because of the great people of faith in Scripture who considered themselves God's slaves. We can do it in the Old Testament. We can do it in the New Testament. Old Testament characters, Moses, Revelation calls him the bondservant of God. That's the word doulos, slave. Joshua, who took his place, the servant of God. Elijah, let it be known that I am your servant. God, speaking of, of David, says, David, my servant. Abraham is spoken of as Abraham, his servant. The prophet Ezekiel speaks of the prophets of Israel being his servants. I mean, those are some big-time names. Those are some great names in the Old Testament. They thought of themselves as servants of God. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament, called the Septuagint, translates this word servant more strongly as doulos or slave. And interestingly, the word doulos or slave appears 122 times in the New Testament, but many of our English translations translate it servant or bondservant instead of slave because even the translators felt a need to soften this. King James translates doulos, slave, as slave one time. But these Old Testament characters thought of themselves as doulos, slaves of God. And then you come to the New Testament, and you can go to, to the beginning of almost any book in the New Testament. Romans, Paul, a bondservant, a doulos of Christ Jesus. James, a bondservant, doulos of Jesus. Simon Peter, bondservant, doulos, slave, apostle of Jesus. Jude, a bondservant, slave, doulos of Jesus. And even John who wrote the book of Revelation, his bondservant, doulos, John. And Paul uses a, a very strong word for servant. He calls himself an under rower. And that word under rower derives its meaning from the military life of the Roman Empire, most notably the warships down in the, in the war galley. There was a section of seats that was only about a foot above the water, and slaves were chained in those seats. And often they were educated people, captives who had been taken by the Roman armies, and they were the under rowers. And Paul spoke of himself as an under rower for Jesus, a slave for Jesus. So, that means when I read Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter, the heroes of the faith, and when I consider the greatest Christians who were the first disciples, the apostles who taught us indeed what it means to be lifelong disciples of Jesus, I can know that they willingly, eagerly, humbly, proudly, gladly saw themselves as slaves of Jesus Christ. But there's a second reason I need to see this as part of my identity it's because of the great teachings of Jesus and the apostles. The great teachings of Jesus and the apostles rely on the slave master analogy. I don't know how familiar you are with Jesus' teachings, but how many times did Jesus start a teaching opportunity or a parable or an illustration like this? For this reason, the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. He wasn't promoting or endorsing slavery. He was pointing to something that existed in his day and saying, this is an illustration of what the kingdom of heaven can be like. In some of his most famous teaching, he used this analogy. Matthew 6, 24, he said, no one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You can't serve two masters. Think about the words that all of us anticipate uh, eagerly someday in eternity. What do we say? You hear it at funerals. You hear people talk. All I want to hear are those words. What words? Help me out. Well done, good and faithful, doulos. Well done, good and faithful, doulos. You've been faithful over a few things. You're a steward. You're going to be ruler over many things. And the great apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 7, he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man, and likewise he was who was called while free is Christ's slave. You've been bought with a price. Don't become slaves of men. So this slave master analogy was used in the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, and this designation as slave of God was something the Old Testament greats and the New Testament greats embraced. And here's a third reason. Because the great images of escape from slavery in Scripture portray a change of masters. Let me explain what I mean by that. Anybody who's talking about freedom from slavery or being released from bondage or abolition, anybody refers back to that great story in the Old Testament of the freedom of the children of Israel leaving the slavery in Egypt. We call it the Exodus. And it's the imagery and the symbol that is used universally to describe escape and deliverance from slavery. But listen to what God said about it in Leviticus 26. I'm the Lord your God, this is verse 13, who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke and I made you walk erect. But if you do not obey me, and you do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances, so as to not carry out all my commandments, and so break my covenant. And in the next verses, he tells us what will happen. In other words, God's saying, I took you out of slavery in Egypt, and you became my slaves. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12, he said, watch yourself that you don't forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God. You shall worship him and swear by, by his name. And a couple of verses later, he says, you are God's own possession. He owns you. That's slave language. You say, what's well, Old Testament? The language of conversion is the same. I read Romans chapter 6 again this morning, verse 16 says, don't you know when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of righteousness to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. And you go down to verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and what? Enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. And so the Bible presents conversion as no longer being slaves to Satan and sin and now being slaves of Christ. Number four, the great confession of Jesus as Lord is an acknowledgement of His mastery over us. We all say it, Jesus is Lord. He's the King of kings, and He's the Lord of lords. And the big thing about the confession of Jesus when it first started happening is that people were saying, in reality, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And that's what caused such big trouble. We have the imagery of Jesus being a servant. He humbled himself, took upon the form of a servant, Philippians 2 says. And later in Philippians 2 and verse 11, it says, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Kyrios. Lord. Kyrios. 
every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus even asked in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me, Kyrios, Kyria, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I, what I say? We're all happy to say Jesus is Kyrios, He's Lord. But the counterpart to Kyrios is doulos. Kyrios, doulos. Master, slave. You want to say it now? He is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So an undeniable, unmistakable part of my identity is that I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Even the good confession is an acknowledgement of His mastery uh, over me. And I can say with the psalmist, low-born men are but a breath, high-born are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they're nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Kyrios doulos, Lord, servant. There's a fifth reason I should consider this, and that's because of the, the great example of Jesus. And we know that Jesus took upon the form of a servant, and we know that He also served. He washed His disciples' feet and in John chapter 13, verse 12, it says, when he washed their feet, when he'd washed their feet and taken his garments. By the way, before I read that, that Scripture says, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going back to God. When you know who you are, you can serve. So Jesus served, and when he'd washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, Kyrios. And you're right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. <laughs> if I'm too good to be a servant then I'm saying I'm better than Jesus, the one whose slave I am, who himself became a servant. I have the great example of Jesus. One more. How about the great benefits that come from submitting to Jesus as your master? You could go to a Christian bookstore today, and you could go to, the, to a section in the bookstore, and you could find books on remembering who you are and knowing and understanding your identity in Christ. And you could go down through the list in the table of contents. Do you ever do that when you're looking, looking at a book? Say, I want to see what this table of contents looks like, see if this is something I'd be interested in. You go down through the table of con contents about our identity in Christ. Most of the books you read on your identity in Christ, you're not going to find servant or slave when it comes to your identity. No, we're going to have the good sounding stuff, the, the positive stuff. And so you might be thinking today, okay, I get it. Why look at this facet of our identity? Why not skip it and focus on the positive ones? This is positive. I didn't know it until last week. John MacArthur's written a book called Slave. So I, I went and bought the book, and I wanted to get it read before this morning and didn't have a, a chance to. I, could just, I just looked over uh, the book. And he said he was presenting this idea of identity in Christ as servant or slave to a group of preachers that all came from a background where their ancestors were slaves. And he said after he'd finished presenting the material, one of them came up to him uh, uh, crying. He said, I believe this. I get it. I, I accept it. I'm a slave of Christ. How in the world am I going to go back and tell my congregation, this is part of your primary identity in Christ. You are slaves. And MacArthur looked at him and said, I got good news for you. Go read John 15, 12. Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> no longer do I call you slaves, I, I call you. Who ever heard of a master laying down his life for his slaves? Who ever heard of a master revealing everything and becoming vulnerable to his slaves? Who ever heard of a master who's an intimate friend to his slaves? Who ever heard of a master who serves his slaves? Who ever heard of a master whose greatest goals and affections and objectives and desires are for the benefit and well-being of his slaves? Who ever heard of a master who loves like Jesus loves? I'm happy to be a doulos of Jesus. Do you remember what the prodigal son discovered when he became willing to sign up as a slave. I'm just going to go home. I'm going to be like one of my father's hired hands. They have it better than me. I'm, I'm going to be like a slave. When he was willing to become a slave, he was accepted as a son. When you and I are willing to be his servants, he accepts us as sons or daughters. It's no wonder that our identity is found in servanthood because real freedom and real greatness and genuine satisfaction and contentment and authentic discipleship, these all come from total submission to Jesus. Slaves of Christ. You say, okay, I get it. I get it. Enough, all right? Six things. That's enough. I get it. I'm a slave of Christ. Maybe I'll even get me a little tattoo. It says, slave of Christ, put it in my arm. You got me, you've got me convinced. So what? What do I do with this? Oh, you serve. Because that's what servants do. And you're not greater than your master. So you serve him, and you serve him by serving others. You can start with that easy on-ramp we've been talking about, Sunday plus two. You're here. You're gathered. We're encouraging one another. You join a group. You get on a serve team, you serve, because that's what servants do. They serve. But let me suggest two other responses just, just real quickly. And by the way, if you're the servant, you do his stuff first. That's what we found out in the very first phrase. You do his stuff first before you, you do your stuff. You do his stuff. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But let me suggest two really concrete responses for you today. Number one, you declare your absolute unwillingness to be a slave to anybody or anything except Christ. If you're a doulos of Kyrios, if you're a slave of Christ, you declare your absolute unwillingness to be a slave to anybody or anything except Christ because there are several powerful evil masters that people choose over Jesus, and Scripture presents them vividly. You might recognize some of them. There's the master of money, wealth, and stuff, and Jesus specifically said you can't serve wealth and me like the rich young ruler. There are people going away sorrowful. There's the approval of people. That's what the Pharisees wanted. They wanted the approval of people. There are several examples in Scripture of that. And if that's your master, you can't serve Jesus. And always look for the approval of people. There's the control of relationships. I often wonder when I look at the man who condemned Jesus to death, Pilate, and I know the little story about his wife having a dream saying, have nothing to do with this man. I wonder if Pilate kept his wife. I wonder if that relationship kept her from ever coming to Christ, just like Herod's relationship with Herodias might have kept him from ever hearing the preaching of, of John the Baptist. Can't serve two masters. You've you got to declare your absolute unwillingness to be a slave to anybody or anything except Christ. How about this one? Sports. You say, oh, you're just taking a shot at that because you can. No. Paul spoke of the priority of the ultimate contest over earthly athletic pursuits. He said, one's temporary, one's eternal. One receives a perishable wreath. The other receives an imperishable wreath. I'm looking around, wondering, what, what do you want for your kids? you want them to be D1 athletes, or would you be happier if they were D1 disciples of Jesus? You can't serve two masters. You've got to declare your absolute unwillingness to be a slave to anybody or anything but Jesus. And, of course, then there's self, chasing my appetite, surrendering to my proclivities, using my time. It's all about me. And, consequently, I become a slave to my addictions and my desires. And, of course, behind it all is the most slavish, evil taskmaster of all, Satan. And I have to say, I am a slave of Christ. I have to become a runaway slave from those other masters or even better, eliminate them. You ever watch a, a movie and a character just knocks the villain unconscious and then ignores him? You know, got the monster knocked down, now turns their back on the monster, and you know what's going to happen. That monster's going to revive. He's going to get up and attack the victim again, and you're watching saying, don't do that. 
Finish the job. Eliminate him. Neutralize the threat permanently. Don't give him another shot at you. And that's why the Bible uses the language of crucifying self and sin, because he is your only master. And you've got to declare your unwillingness to be enslaved to anybody or anything except Christ. And number two, you have to prove your absolute willingness to submit to Christ's ownership and control of your life. And that's active and it's attitudinal. It's active because we're not just servants in title only. Our identity has a practical outworking. In this case, it, it means I am not greater than him, so I serve him by serving others. And it's attitudinal because according to Jesus, it means I lose my sense of entitlement and I replace it with humility. It doesn't mean I wear shackles and chains. It doesn't mean the Bible approves of slavery. It doesn't mean I don't have a life. It doesn't mean I live in slave quarters. It's not a literal thing. It doesn't mean I'm controlled by a selfish tyrant or, or beaten and abused. It doesn't mean I approve of slavery. On the contrary, this type of a life will abolish the evils of servitude. This is voluntary. It means I signed up. I'm bought, owned, possessed, and led by Jesus. It means that I do what he did and humble myself in obedience by emptying myself, taking on the form and role of a servant all the way to the end. And in some ways, it is an even greater commitment because a physical or literal slave could nurse his or her own thought, life, and emotions in whatever direction without the master knowing it. But our master knows all, sees all, hears all, and reads all. He gets every part of you. He knows you, yet he loves you. And so the last chapters of the Bible paint a picture of dwelling with God in heaven. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve Him. They'll see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. We'll be marked with ownership as belonging to Him, but that's a good thing. And we have the privilege of serving Him for all eternity. So when you come to Christ as His servant, you're not going to argue about what he asks you to do. You're just going to do it. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for making this part of our identity in you. We are your servants. We trust you. Curios, Lord. Amen. Hey, before you go, one quick thing. We have two accepted offers on MG2. The, uh, yes, for almost, for almost the uh, full uh, asking price, if the financing were to fall through on the first one, the second one is a cash offer. God continues to work and provide for us. We're grateful for that, and I wanted to give you that little piece of good news. Have a great week this week.